What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Lionheart, Legacy of the Crusader. So if this is the first video of mine you're watching, I'd love to review video games. I'm really into the CRPG genre, which is why we are reviewing a very old title like Lionheart in 2021. But normally I review games after I 100% them. However, with these older titles that don't even have achievements to begin with, I usually go for a more retrospective type review. However, the word retrospective tends to be a bit loaded on YouTube and come with a certain meaning of content, so I don't usually actually use that word. But to start us off, let's talk a little bit about Lionheart itself, or at least the situation around its release. So if you're unaware, Lionheart is the very last game that was published by Black Isle Studios before they were shut down by Interplay. Originally, Lionheart was released in 2003, which means Lionheart was one of the games that kind of marked the decade or so, just drought of CRPG games and what was kind of considered a dead genre for about a decade there, and until we start to see Pillars of Eternity, Divinity, the Shadowrun series, etc. start to be released. Despite being one of the last games from around that time period, Lionheart is not particularly well remembered. The reason for why is quite straightforward, and to be honest with you, I have a fair few complaints about Lionheart. However, pretty much all of that is explained by jumping back a little bit and remembering when I said that it was the last game published by Black Isle Studios. The game itself was developed by Reflexive Entertainment, which these days was incorporated into Amazon Game Studios after being bought out. But because Black Isle was being shut down, the situation was basically publish what they had or don't get to publish anything. And as such, Lionheart is a very mixed game. And in fact, there is a point at the game where it feels like you just start playing a separate game, actually. And it's truthfully a little bit jarring. But with no further ado, let's actually jump into this title. And I'm going to mix up my format just a little bit here for this particular review. And I'm going to talk about the first half or so of the game, if you will. And then I'm going to talk about the second half, which is truthfully where most of my complaints are. The good parts of Lionheart are, for starters, or at least for me, the story. So if you're unaware, the story set up for Lionheart is that it is an alternative history in which, during the Crusades of the 1100s, that saw Richard the Lionheart sacrifice a bunch of prisoners as part of a military operation, and this actually completed some dark ritual in which the real world was flooded with things like demons, goblins, all that sort of stuff. And because of this, we saw the rise of things like the Inquisition that led us down an alternative timeline in which the Inquisition and the Knights Templar basically rule most of what is known of the world. Which brings us to the 1500s when the game starts, which sees us escaping slavers kind of right off the bat and being thrust into Barcelona. Now, without spoilers, that's about all I'm going to go into just in case you happen to decide to play this game for yourself. But from there, let's talk a bit about character creation. Character creation uses a reskinned Fallout special system, especially if you are familiar with the early CRPG Fallout systems, you'll be very familiar with how character creation works in this game. But you're going to start out by picking a race. You can be a pure-blood human, which is to say just a human, or you can pick one of three mixed races. Basically, these are races that are essentially human. However, they saw some mingling with magic in their heritage and as such have extra features that would mark them as someone not entirely human. These being the demon kin, the sylvan kin, that type of thing. Now picking one of these races is going to adjust your special stats accordingly, and from here you can actually also pick traits. Traits are where you trade off positive for a negative, that kind of thing, to help you kind of specialize and make a backstory for your character, if you will. From here, we can pick skills. Skills are fairly simple. There's combat skills, the more social skills or around town, non-combat type stuff. And then there are the three magic disciplines, divine magic, thought magic, and wild magic, if you will. Now, thought magic is your standard, like, elemental stuff. Divine is usually more for melee builds that kind of affect the more physical aspects of the world, etc. Now, truth be told, of these magic trees, you do see a lot of overlap in what the actual spells will do for you, so even then it's kind of open. And then to finish off character creation, you're going to pick a spirit kind. This is your guardian spirit. This is basically the thing that is actually giving you your magic abilities. Because when that event happened that brought the demons and things into the world, spirits also came through. However, they don't have any real agency in the world unless they bond to someone. And when a spirit bonds to you, this is what will give you access to your magic. And as such, you get to pick a spirit kind to follow you throughout the game. 
Now, mostly what you're doing here is just picking the nature of the spirit kind, like what kind of spirit it is. And this will have bonuses, but isn't super restricting. And it will also kind of color the personality of the spirit who talks to you throughout the game. Though, honestly, that comes up a lot less than I personally would have liked. And then, this being Fallout Special System, you do actually get perks to choose from. However, you'll get them outside of character creation for the most part. As you level up, every few levels, you'll get to pick a perk, which is just a flat benefit in comparison to a trait. Honestly, the best part about this game is the beginning of it, that is to say Barcelona. Now, this city is going to see you interacting with a few different factions. Each of these factions will actually have a unique quest. You have to join one of the major factions in order to proceed with the story. However, there are minor factions around the town as well that you can interact with who will also give you quests, but the major factions you can only join one of per playthrough, meaning you can lock yourself off from quests, and each one of these factions is going to ask you to do different things around Barcelona before finally all of the major factions converge and kind of send you outside of Barcelona to continue the plot. But while you are in Barcelona, all of these quests for the most part have multiple ways to complete them, or at least some of them do. A lot of the quests are oftentimes like, ah, go kill this one guy, and you know, there's only really so many ways to do that. But for the most part, things around Barcelona are going to see you making use of all of your skills and things that you picked in character creation. There's a lot of options, especially with the factions and everything that you'll be interacting with. The factions themselves are actually pretty interesting, and I especially liked that when you join the factions, it actually does give you ranks in that faction that you can see on your character sheet. And these ranks, as you go through them, will actually give you benefits to your character as well. So joining the Knights Templar will give you combat skills and HP, whereas joining the Inquisition will give you intelligence points plus HP and then some other stuff. You can also join the wielders, which are like mages who are hunted by the Inquisition, that type of stuff. There's just a lot of really cool content around these factions, and I had a lot of fun with that. Once you're ready to leave Barcelona, that is to say you completed all of your quests for your major faction that you chose to join, all three factions are going to send you to the same place to investigate something, which is where the plot kind of picks up more. I don't want to spoil it, but basically that's what happens. From here, you're sent on a path to the second town, which is a name I cannot pronounce. Truthfully, this second town is also very fun. It's a lot of the same kind of stuff. Quests, multiple ways to solve them, siding with one group versus another, just a lot of ways to interact and do stuff. And up until this point, I was honestly having a blast and I was impressed with this game. Unfortunately, as soon as you get done with this second town, that's where the game takes a sharp dive and honestly feels like a different game. Because while there have been pain points up until this point, they were for the most part something you could overlook simply because I was having a lot of fun with all of the other RPG mechanics. But as soon as you get done with the second town, we start moving into what I would consider the bad part of the game, which is going to be the second half of this video, if you will, where we talk about basically everything I don't like, which is basically the second half of this game. So everything after that second town is basically just one giant dungeon crawl. Each dungeon is probably going to take you a couple hours to clear because they are gigantic and sprawling, and they go from all this RPG-related quest stuff to just a pure combat slog. The earlier game had a lot of combat, but for the most part it was fair, and in some cases avoidable. But from here, it's just a straight RPG hack and slash. It feels like you're playing a Diablo clone. And the second half of the game, unfortunately, also makes it to where that if you picked anything besides a combat-focused build for the beginning of the game, you're probably going to have to restart or just not have a good time in the second half. While you will occasionally meet vendors and things along your dungeon crawl that will react to certain speech skills, etc. to give you a discount, that's about as in-depth as it gets. But this brings up the other problem, because while, okay, the game switches focus on you to a combat hack and slash, weird but not unforgivable necessarily. But here's the thing, the combat in Lionheart is not great. Combat uses this real-time with pause system, but mostly it's just real time and sometimes you can pause. Because while you can, of course, pause, you can't really do anything while you're paused besides use items from your inventory. So you can chug potions and things while you're paused, but that's about it. And beyond that, it's just a hack and slash. And because of the way this old game handles things like its magic system and the fact that enemies will rush you and the fact that there's a million enemies that can kill you within a few hits, especially if you didn't spec into like a big melee tank guy, you're in for a very long, frustrating dungeon crawl for the last half. 
Now, again, there are characters that you will meet in the last half of the game that can react to your speech. You can actually talk your way out of the last boss fight if you have the appropriate speech check, but those are really the exception and not the rule. Now, while you're doing these dungeon crawls and things, and earlier in the game too a little bit, you will occasionally meet characters who will join you, sometimes temporarily, sometimes for the rest of the game. And while these companions are welcome, unfortunately, you have no control over them. And if you don't have some sort of healing spell, they're almost guaranteed to die very quickly. And their AI is woefully stupid, so they tend to just rush headlong into enemies that they cannot possibly beat because there's just too many enemies, which means all of the companions are pretty forgettable, even though there are, like, I believe, four or five of them. From there, let's wrap this up a little bit. Lionheart. Interesting game, honestly. The fact is, it's super cheap these days because it's so old. Its full price is 10 bucks. You can actually find it on sale for less than that. I believe I picked it up for like four. But more than anything, Lionheart, like a lot of games from this era where publishers were just absolutely pushing to get things out, and in this particular case, were shut down actually immediately after. These games just have this tendency to make me feel like, what if, you know, what if they had gotten the chance to make the game they wanted to make? Because the first part of this game is honestly something special. They were onto something. It worked. I was having fun. And then you get to that last part, and it's just like, you get to a point, and it's just like, I don't even really want to play this anymore. Like, if I wasn't doing this review, I probably would not have finished this game. That's how much of a jarring shift it was. But nonetheless, Lionheart kind of holds that weird place in history for CRPGs and kind of just video games in general. So if you're interested in checking it out, I would recommend it just because it's so cheap. But I, honestly, even $10, I'd recommend picking it up on a sale. Basically, my gist is this. If you want to check out Lionheart, I would really only recommend it if you are just honestly interested in seeing that bit of CRPG history. But beyond that, I'd watch a YouTube video like this and move on. So there you go guys, there is my review of Lionheart, Legacy of the Crusader, a curious title that makes me think of what could have been. Thank you so much for watching, may you wander in wisdom, and have an amazing day.